Hello ladies and gentlemen this is Nishant and welcome to another episode of the Nishant Gill show the mission of the show is to spread awareness on mindfulness practices psychology mental health and spirituality my job on the show is to invite world class performers to share the practices to live a fulfilled life today's guest is Dr Kate Dow Dr Kate is a leadership development expert educator psychologist retreat facilitator and coach she is a TEDx national speaker and an author and Amazon bestseller of Fearless the art of using anxiety to your advantage she helps women globally in their business life and spiritual leadership development so they can navigate life's struggles with more confidence ease and resourcefulness women entrepreneurs and CEOs are able to challenge the status quo and create sustainable success and positive impact without the sacrifice stress and burnout in this episode dr kate discusses self awareness balance between feminine and masculine energy flow of higher power mindfulness getting into inner child calming your body and soul using anxiety to your advantage personal development is a lifelong process mental health journaling emotional intelligence and meditation and much more so keep listening Dr. Kit, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nishant. I'm so glad to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. Can we start with something from your TED talk you mentioned about your depression when you were 12 years old? Can you walk us through about that? Sure. Well, I you know, I grew up in a family that pretended that everything was fine and actually had a lot of unresolved generational trauma. There was a lot of alcoholism and neglect and I experienced a lot of anxiety and depression when I was young and that just kind of continued on through different episodes of my life where when you know things were difficult i would fall back and recognize wow i have to continue to work on myself so that i can be okay no matter what's happening but when i was 12 that was a very important time because i was really awakening to the reality of my family dynamic and the reality of the world and it was not it was not an easy thing to take in and i felt very sad and overwhelmed with how people did not know how to take care of themselves they didn't love themselves they didn't um know how to communicate people were suffering and that was very painful for me people suffer every time everybody yes. suffers to some extent yes where did you grow up I actually grew up in LA and it was not a great place for me. <laughs> the best place was when I was at the beach or sailing on a sailboat in the ocean. Wherever I could be closest to nature felt a good place for me where I could feel calmer and more connected in myself. And but the city itself was not easy, very full of concrete and lots of people and cars and smog and <laughs> it was yeah it was the, the big city what would you say to our listeners who are from LA <laughs> gosh i i think people who choose to live there are able to find their groove and their way to take care of themselves and i think that's fabulous uh because it also is a very powerful place for change you know there's lots of opportunity there's lots of industry there so that you can you can really make gains in a lot of ways but f- for me i i think i was just a little too sensitive to really thrive in that environment did you have that level of awareness in your childhood days i i did in some ways and in and in many ways i learned very quickly to what i call step into that coping strategy of overfunctioning what i saw in my family and what i now call kind of the patriarchal version of you know working hard and being better and pushing pushing the edge all the time and so that became my strategy was was achievement and that very much helped me feel stronger but it didn't really take care of me as we know right because <laughs> you're you're always operating from still not good enough yet and uh, that perfectionism it it takes a huge impact in many ways so my awareness was always there 
but it would get sidelined with my coping strategies. I will come back to this coping strategy and finding the balance between all these things. How does your family describe now what you do for a living? Well, my family, you know, my <laughs> my parents are past and I my brother, you know, he kind of is not has not fallen the same path as me in terms of spiritual awakening and growth and development in the same way. So it's been a bit of a solo journey. You talk about anxiety, depression. Do you still go through those emotions? I think that they're part of being a human being, Nishant. You know, especially now, especially if you're a sensitive human being, if you're not experiencing what it means to have just the anxiety of being a human being, then you're probably not really paying attention <laughs> to the impact of just all of the change, as well as the reality of the uncertainty and impermanence that we all live with. So in many ways, my anxiety was part of recognizing the state of imbalance in the world and the need for awakening that it kind of is my journey and my mission. And so spiritual path and personal development became my go-to for managing, and they still are today. Do you feel that we can get into personal development without having the spiritual foundation? I think that that's what's given to us in our culture, especially Western culture. You can take these little pieces and work on this as if they're isolated. But no, I don't think that you fully develop and integrate and implement transformation unless it's all connected with spiritual, you know, with our physiological care and well-being, with our mental development and mindfulness. It's a whole package because it all interrelates inside of us, whether we see that or not. You coach women in their leadership, or I should say leadership, L-E-A-D-H-E-R-S-H-I-P. You are an educator, psychologist, retreat facilitator, coach. How do you do so many of the things? <laughs> well, at these days, I do them very intentionally and only with the right situations. I don't say yes to everything. I've learned that that only dissipates really my ability to be my best, you know, with every person. The leadership is my way of communicating the importance of women especially, but really it's for men as well, to understand and develop that feminine reconnection, that integration of feminine principles and traits of leadership that have been sorely missed in the patriarchy and that I believe is an imperative part of us coming back to balance not only as human beings, but in our relationship with life and our businesses and our well-being. Is this model of leadership is applicable to men as well? It, it really is. Uh, of course, you know, men have been denied the uh, <laughs> value of the feminine as well, right? Men have been told, well, depending on your culture, however that's communicated, uh, that, you know, there's these masculine principles of strength and courage and, and success that are very much disconnected especially here in the West, at least, from this, this, you know, the yin. If we look at the yin and yang together, there's that balance that you spoke of earlier, that need for inherent awareness of action and inaction, right? Behavior going out and personal growth going in. And those are the ways that might help describe that better. All men have this feminine component, and it's not easy for all the men to accept that. It was difficult for me to accept that we all have this component. It's it's a dance between feminine and masculine, and all the female have the same thing as well. Oh, definitely. I mean, like for me, I kind of grew up more being like my father. I wanted to feel strong and capable, and so I overworked and overachieved, and worked on, you know, feeling strong, and I denied my inner sensitivities, my, my inner knowing, my intuition. I 
denied that part of me that knew when it was time to rest and to go within and to allow that kind of falling apart and deeper transformation that is a feminine quality of change and honoring that time. It took, it took me having things hit me very hard and become crises at different times in my life. Going back to the transformation and uh, in this personal development, transformation is a very normal word and this involves working on so many different facets. When somebody is starting into this personal development and transformation, it becomes so much overwhelming where to start from, you know, when we get started, where to end because there is no end. It, because there are so many books, so many things to learn. How can we relax and enjoy this journey? Well, I, that's part of the feminine, I would say, too, is how, <laughs> how, how do we just trust our own journey? Because, you know, I'm never, I'm never um, surprised, really, when I meet people and we have all had these incredible journeys and we've come across the right book or the right teacher that was just right for us at that time. And so it's, it's almost like getting out of your own way and this is developing that trust in the universe or God or whatever you consider is that uh, sense of higher power so that you can really allow life to flow and bring to you what is, what is meant to come. And that is a very feminine principle that is not valued very much in our society, is it? Are you saying that we get to believe in the flow of the higher power and still keep taking action? Exactly, right? We allow what comes and then we, we still show up, right? We still show up and do whatever our personal work is. For example, a lot of my first work with personal development and spiritual growth was about attending to my inner mind and my belief systems and the way that my, my my own mind talked to myself you know my inner critic and it get would get me caught right in certain ways of being and ways of responding to the world that really that really diminished me and kept me stuck and so that was like a place that i started and it's a place of course that i come back to <laughs> all the time because it's an endless journey of clearing our mind and supporting mindfulness and awareness that really serves us. But personal development is not a race. It's more of a spiral for me. That's why I have that as my logo. You know, our growth continues throughout our life and we're never done. And so don't rush, just trust what's in front of you, do your best and, and receive what the next sense of direction is for you. This is so profound, actually. When you're ready, the right teacher appears. We have so many books, so many things to learn. And when we are open to new possibilities, then the right book, the right teacher, the right coach will come in front of us. We just got to be focused. It's challenging, actually, to be patient in that process, right? I think it is when we're living in that um when then when we're living from that point of view of again of sort of the patriarchy like hurry up you should you should know this you should learn all of this now it's how we are with our businesses especially now with what's going on right everybody's in this oh my gosh i have to hurry up and figure this out and then get it going and be successful and hurry 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 push 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 and that doesn't serve us or the, the situation because we're living in uncertainty. So therefore, what is our truest advantage is to go within, calm down, be present, see what the right next step is for you and do that and trust that the right next step will unfold and reveal itself to you. What practices do you have in your personal life? To get into your inner mind is calming your body, calming your soul. It's, again, going back to the mindfulness thing. Right. Well, I have a number of practices because I 
I, I have loved all of the different paths that I've studied, right? So I've studied more yoga, kundalini yoga, and that's been something I knew and learned and came across when I was around 12 and touched into at different points and then eventually decided to become certified as a kundalini yoga and meditation teacher. I also studied with... At the age of 12? Yeah, I didn't do the training at 12. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who introduced um, you to kundalini yoga at the age of 12? Well, I was living in LA and my, my mother and I went and visited the ashram down in town, downtown LA. And we were meeting a woman who my mom was planning to meet and I got to go be involved and do some yoga and see Yogi Bhajan and very much knew it was a supportive thing. We became connected in the community and I even came out to New Mexico when I was a young teenager to go to the women's camp, even though it was a little too much for me at that point. But I always knew it was there. And when I'd come back to it at different times in my life, it it never let me down. It, it was so powerful. And so that's part of my practice still every day, along with tantric teachings that I've learned, both Native American Kudoshka tra training, as well as Heart Tantra. And so I, I do that as well, because that's a very similar path. It comes from yoga, from Kundalini Yoga, and it's sort of a more um, esoteric version that's about working with consciousness with the masculine, feminine energies in our bodies and helping that help us evolve and grow. And I also just, you know, really appreciate learning. Somatic meditation has been a big piece for me. So growing with the Tibetan Buddhism, tr learning with Pema Chodron, as well as Dharma Ocean, and practicing these Tibetan somatic meditations have been very powerful for me, especially around the work with anxiety. So I kind of every morning <laughs> get up and I have a practice every morning and I sometimes I'm working on a specific Kriya for a while and I'll do some reading and I'll do some meditation and and it absolutely helps me be myself as opposed to being dissociated or fearful or caught in that hurrying, rushing, pushing place of my past it just keeps me in the now throughout the day. No matter what's coming, I can come back to that. I can practice some breath work. I can come back to center again and again because we never stay there, right? It's, right. it's like we're always falling off center. Come back. Uh, your mind gets crazy, you come back. <laughs> and and that's, that's the work. And that's the beauty of it is we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be getting an A. We just do the best we can every day. It is everyday practice and, you know, not every day is a great day. You mentioned <laughs> a couple of practices such as yoga, somatic meditation, different kinds of meditation practices, mm -hmm. tantric practice. What is tantric practice? Well, tantric is that um, esoteric version of the kundalini yoga that, you know, there, I think there's different, you know, schools like there are yoga. But the particular path that I was initially drawn to was what's been called different things, pink tantra, heart tantra, and it comes from the lineage of Babaji. And it's just a, it's a form of yoga that's more focused on moving energy through your body, paying attention to the vital force and the combination of masculine and feminine energy. And it's, it's a way of building consciousness, just like yoga just in a slightly different way. Do we have to do all of it every day or we can just pick one of it? Oh, certainly most people just pick one, Nishan. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've sort of been one of those persons that loves many things. And I, I like to have my mosaic of things that I, that I love, which has been my way in spiritual tradition. I love them all and I don't just choose one and become specific to that one which what is what would you <laughs> say to people who have not done even one of these practices oh i would say i would say you know be courageous and f see if there's something that you feel interested in and curious about and try it on and and give it some time and see how it 
impacts you because again, it's sort of like the spiritual teachers or the, the powerful books, you know, everybody, we have to find what is the fit for us. Our path is unique. Our vibration or who we are is unique. So trust that. And then if you try something and you really give it a shot and you're like, wow, I'm not so sure this is it, then be open and see what's next. Ed, I want to ask you, what have you gained from all these practices? Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, I don't think I'd be here. <laughs> Literally, like getting through the, ch- the challenges I've had as a human being, as um, a single mom of two, as a woman sort of feeling a solo on her path and uh, facing and coming through cancer. I've had a lot of, of challenges that I think my practice gave me the fortitude and the courage to keep showing up even when it felt uh, so overwhelming, so impossible to get through. It, It gave me that sense of my capacity to keep showing up and also take care of myself and know that I could, I could learn to create a a positive mindset I could learn to take care of myself. I could make better choices so that I could actually be who I knew I wanted to be, which which I have. I feel like I've been able to come back to myself in a sense. you see somebody is struggling in their life and they need help but they're not sure where to get it started from what would you advise well when we're suffering sometimes we feel too scared to look for help um, because the shame right the shame that we can give ourselves says you know we don't deserve it or nobody will want to help us but there's so many fabulous people and teachers and practitioners who are here to be of service. And so once again, if something has crossed your path, somebody has said, oh, this person's really good at acupuncture, or this person is a really good therapist or a coach, try it out. You know, give yourself permission to be supported. I think that's the biggest deterrent for most of us as human beings is that we're afraid of feeling worse about ourselves or we're afraid of being rejected. But the truth is there's so many people who love to be of service and help people. Is it okay to feel worse sometimes? Not all the time, sometimes, but coming back to the positive side. Oh, for sure. I think I think we wouldn't be human beings. I mean... You know, we wouldn't be human beings. It's it's always a cycle. We don't cross the finish line and we're like, oh, I'm happy forever. It just, my experience has not been that, Nishant. <laughs> and this is a great point. We need to understand that personal development or any study of of all these spiritual texts and anything along these lines will not make you perfect, will not make you happy and fulfilled forever but this is going to give you tools that will make you more resilient. When you feel worse, then you can come back onto the track as soon as possible. You don't stick to the negativity. Right. Because then you, you know, you have these, these tools and these ways of being that can support you. And so, you know, we can all have those bad days, especially with what's been going on, right? It's a very difficult time and it's, it, I find that the, the greatest gift of developing ourselves and our spiritual growth is learning to have compassion and love and acceptance of ourselves. Do you have some practices to cultivate self-compassion? Well, uh, of course, I have like probably many, but for, <laughs> for, for, for me, when I, when I show up in the morning to do my practice, no matter whether or not my mind says, oh, let's just go get working on that other project instead. 
And I say, no, dear, sit down. <laughs> Let's do our practice. It'll be so much easier and so much more fun if we do this first. And I have compassion for that part of me that wants to run off and do the next thing. Or I just sit down and I, I, I get present with what is, what is happening. What's going on inside me? What are my thoughts, my feelings? I do my practices. I attend to myself. And from that place, I automatically have compassion because I am now present in myself. And when I, I arrive there, when I arrive there and be present, I absolutely embody compassion for myself and other people. Do and you the world. journal on your thoughts? I really don't anymore right now. I find that I'm appreciating just being in the moment with it for myself, but I think journaling is a fabulous tool to have. Did you ever do it in your life? Oh, definitely. When I was younger, I would journal and I would write poetry and that was a very power well actually for many years I I did journaling and I think that was part of self-care for me as well, like to acknowledge what was going on for me really helped me stay stay more present and more positive because I could talk about how hard things were and then I could kind of give myself a boost and say, you can do this. I love you. I'm here for you. Let's keep going. <laughs> this is kind of a mental dump. You are putting all the feelings on paper or any practice or through through any medium, you can put all your negative feelings and then shifting the gears from negative side to the positive side. Right, because we become aware. As soon as we're willing to become aware of what's going on, then we have a choice. Is there any book that comes to your mind to become more aware? There's there's so many books, you know. Again, I I I guess for night, right now I'm I'm going to just talk about my book because Please. Uh, because I feel like if you have anxiety as a woman who's in business or a woman just in your life, you're in transition. And men as and, well. <laughs> and men as well. But my book was written for women, but I had a lot of men read it and love it just as much. But it is written for women because I go into the discussion of why women inherently have anxiety growing up and living in a patriarchy and where the feminine is devalued and disempowered. And so there's an understanding of a bigger context of why you might have anxiety. And then the understanding that if you can accept your anxiety, learn to understand what it's actually trying to get your attention and have the courage to begin to go into development and understanding of your what's happening on your mind level, you know, what are you telling yourself and how is what is your body really needing to feel calmer? Those, that practice is all about self-awareness on a mind, body, spirit level. And it, it automatically opens us to the choice of empowerment. Recognizing that, is the key, actually, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. How can somebody recognize their anxiety? Everybody has it. Not everybody recognizes, right? Oh, for sure. <music> You are not alone in this journey. We all struggle in life. There is no shame in talking about it. I go through my highs and lows. I get depressed. But these practices really help me in living a resilient and mindful life. You can also do this. You got this. Don't judge yourself. Sure, I didn't even realize I had it till it was really exacerbated after I had children and it was a postpartum anxiety. I hadn't recognized that that what I felt throughout my life was anxiety. So anxiety can, you know, some people have panic or or generalized anxiety attacks, but the majority of people have a sort of a low grade anxiety like I had where you feel a level of uncertainty and discomfort just being out in the world and communicating and and living and there's a a place inside you where you just don't feel 
trust in yourself or or safe in the world and that's a level of anxiety i think a lot of people feel and override especially with business right we can have worry financially but we override it and we just become hard hard working people who who you know push ourselves to the limit and then we can get really burned out and we're not even effective or happy or satisfied with what we're doing anymore should we consult any mental health professional or therapist or somebody to get rid of this anxiety well i definitely think that there's lots of ways to get support and therapy is definitely an option as well as a you know coach who's very trained in that area you know for me what made the difference and why i wrote my book was that it wasn't just about talking about anxiety it was about how i approached it as a multidimensional process of growth and that was very different so the way that i approach anxiety working with people is very different than a lot of other people could you walk us through some of the steps in brief sure for example from a mental point of view you really want to start establishing that self awareness and developing what i call your witness so that you can start to pay attention to that inner dialogue that's running all the time you know the old habits of calling saying to yourself like what's wrong with you you didn't do it right or the ways we that we berate ourselves that's the one of the first steps and then when we work with that awareness in the body we're working with the archetype of the heroine having that courage to start paying attention to how you really feel and what you really need and when we start to develop what that emotional intelligence that makes such a huge difference in how we can relate and our anxiety doesn't need to be so big right to try and get our attention and then the archetype of the goddess is the spiritual dom- domain where we really do start to work with those principles of loving kindness and self acceptance and compassion as a way to recognize this higher way of looking at ourselves you know not to be so critical to be more forgiving and to understand we're all doing our best so so many of these steps i'm giving a very brief point but they all you know we just go back in a circle like the spiral we develop on all these levels and we start to create a sense of self mastery like oh i know i can see how I was giving myself all this negative input and then I pushed myself and I didn't eat and I didn't get good sleep and then I felt so isolated and so disconnected from everybody that I wasn't able to work well at all and we start to see how everything connects like a web and we understand oh I can have one impact on this web paying attention to how I talk to myself and that will slowly impact the whole web not only me but how i show up with my employees with my with my family with my friends my community we see it all connected can we reduce our anxiety through 7 to 8 hours of sleep Oh definitely sleep is a big one right cuz you know we already know research shows that like something like 80% of the people out there are not getting good sufficient deep sleep and so sleep is is absolutely a place that people are uh, unaware of how important it is and not only again just for our physical well-being but it's for our brain to be able to work it's for our nervous system to be at its best and our ability to you know process and digest life you know we need sleep to do that but it can be difficult for high achievers to prioritize sleep right right until they really start to get impacted right because that was me i mean so many things were impacted and i hit the wall and had really bad burnout right so you're right high achievers tend to go i don't need sleep it's not and, for us right until <laughs> usually we wait until we have a physical symptom how many hours do you sleep now 
Oh, I, I'm actually a big sleeper. I mean, I, I didn't ever cut off my sleep because I, I'm a person who's always been aware that I, I function so much better on every level if I get a lot of sleep. So I tend to sleep closer to eight, nine hours. That is me. If I don't sleep well, <laughs> I can't function. I, I know. cannot function. And, you know, and, and I used to know people who would be like, oh, that's what's wrong with you that you need that much sleep. And they'd try and shame me about it. But, but I could see them and how they underslept, right? They prioritize that high achieving, I can go, go, go. And I could see how it was impacting them, right? Their, their emotional uh, regulation was a little off. They were more easily upset and irritable. They, their health was up and down, you know, everybody's different, but yeah, sleep is so important. I want to ask you, you teach people in developing leadership. Then how do you incorporate mindfulness, emotional intelligence in their practices? Right. Well, I first I show them what what it looks like when you don't have that, right? When you don't have mindfulness as a leader, when you don't have mindfulness in your culture, then that's sort of what we see when there's a lack of awareness, uh, a lack of, of consciousness of people's own personal biases, right? How people talk to each other. All of that is a reflection of how aware are you of yourself and how you think and how you then project that out into the world and how you communicate. And so it's, it's very, I love it because I love helping people put the pieces together and awareness does that. When you talk about mindfulness to your clients, let's say your client is a Christian or from some religious background, mm -hmm. do you receive any pushback on meditation or any other mindfulness practice from somebody who is a religious person? You know, I, I spoke to the, yeah, I do have that happen. And I do, I communicated about this in my book as well, because that unfortunately, a lot of the, what, what do we call self-help movement, personal growth development, like meditation and mindfulness does get seen as somehow a religious um, affiliated behavior. And so it does take a little education around recognizing that you know even yoga is not a religious behavior it's it's a it's a lifestyle it's a it's a, it's a development of it self can be secular it doesn't have to be religious and for somebody who is religious they don't have to use word namaste in yoga you know Right, right. I mean, it's similar to, we could look at the 12-step recovery programs, right? They were Christian-based, and the books that were written, you know, for them have the word God in them. And for many people who were coming into the 12-step programs would say, well, I'm not Christian, and I don't like the word God, and so I, I can't do this. But it was very, very clear that this is about taking what works for you and leaving the rest. And if that means not using the word God and your sense of higher power is yourself or the group or a friend or your sponsor, then you find what that is for you. So it's the same with yoga and meditation is you say, okay, so take what works, put it in a context that you feel comfortable with. Because if you say to somebody who has a specific religious belief, this is only going to enhance your connection with your beliefs and how they support you in your life. That's how I see it. Meditation can be challenging and difficult for a lot of beginners. What would you recommend them to be consistent? Well, I think the first thing is to understand that meditation isn't necessarily about feeling better. <laughs> that if, if we have that expectation then, you know, that will be something that we'll easily walk away from. But if we recognize that it's really about gaining awareness and presence and that that is what is going to feel better, it's not that suddenly, you know, every time you sit, 
that it's going to be easy because you're paying attention and becoming more aware of your mind. And our mind is, <laughs> it's not an always easy place to be in, right? Our mind can be very chaotic and very intrusive and very negative and caught in all kinds of things. But meditation is really about a practice like going to the, like going to the gym, right? You, you strengthen those muscles so that you can function better in your, in your body. And meditation is a way of strengthening those muscles of awareness so that you can feel more resilient and more capable of coming back to center in the day. Now, when I started, I had two little kids very small kids. <laughs> and my only chance to be alone was if I got up early before they did at six o'clock. Uh, <laughs> they got up at six and, you know, I was a single mom and I was like, oh my God, I, all I can do is get up like 10 minutes early. And that was my beginning as I'd go sit in the living room, I'd sit on the floor and I'd sit in quiet. And for me at that point, that's all I could do was sit quiet I couldn't really follow any particular way of doing meditation. It felt too much. Just sitting quiet. And I noticed, Nishant, that just sitting quiet for those 10 minutes was so powerfully impactive. I mean, I, it made a difference on how stressed I got for the rest of the day. And I thought, oh, my gosh. How, do, how is that even possible? I just sat here quiet for 10 minutes. And... You know, normally by the time I'd get to dinner time, I would be very sh short in my attitude and my energy and feel like, oh gosh, let's just get through and get everyone to bed. And my temper was very taut. And if I did this 10 minutes quiet, just sitting and being, I had a little more room, a little more space for myself. Silence is the doorway to inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. I just made it up. <laughs> It is. It's amazing. So then I was like, oh my gosh, if 10 minutes does that, what, what would happen if I did 15? And that's what got me hooked. It takes time. It takes time and it takes effort to get it started from a small number. You can get it started from one minute or two minutes. There is no right or wrong way to meditate. You can just sit quietly, you know, the way Kate is saying, just sit quietly even for five minutes, for two minutes. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. feels it feels better you know it it just we we move from our left brain to right brain mm -hmm. we move from our thinking mind to the conscious mind mm -hmm. and speaking of consciousness you talk about conscious leadership what is the difference between just leadership and conscious leadership well for me conscious leadership is recognizing that your path of being a leader like being a human, because I consider leadership across all, all areas, right? Leadership in business, leadership in our life, leadership in our spiritual path. It's, it's really all about how we live our life to be more conscious of the path of awakening and developing our self-mastery. And when we do that, when we live intentionally versus just sort of by chance, we have the opportunity to develop, I would say, more vertically, right? Conscious development is like a vertical development versus a, a horizontal. What does that mean? It means that we can make strides in not only how we show up, but how we perceive things and then how we respond to them. That makes a difference. And these days, we need conscious leadership, I believe, because we're at a time that old systems and old paradigms are no longer sufficient. And in order for us to break through and have the opportunity for real positive change in humanity globally, that's going to take conscious leadership, right? Where leaders are consciously developing so that they can be the most, you know, continued, developed, awake people who are recognizing that making choices from consciousness is different than making choices from our ego, right? From our own personal satisfaction. We become more serving to the larger humanity. And that is what I think is needed right now. It is needed, definitely. 
I want to ask you what makes you happy and fulfilled in life. What makes me happy is you know when I when I'm <laughs> when I'm living my life consciously, I'm usually more happy, right? When I'm very for me being aligned with a sense of purpose makes me personally happy, right? Like I've felt that since I was a little kid. Like I'm here to serve let me hurry up and grow up so i can help and that's just part of my sense of purpose and that makes me feel very uh fulfilled and and happy does it ever happen to you that some days you feel you are living a purpose driven life some days you know nothing is happening what is going on what should i do definitely i mean oh most definitely in this in this time there's these periods of nothing moving and and then i remember and i i've even had it where you know cuz i work with oracle decks often for support for myself and i get reminded of of the story of chinese bamboo you know when they plant baby chinese bamboo it sits there and stays the same size for years and it looks if you didn't know better you'd think well it's not thriving what's going on it's not growing but what it's really doing all those years is it's growing those roots down deep into the earth getting strong and fortified and then suddenly boom it starts growing like a weed up into the air becoming this beautiful tall bamboo so the story is that sometimes it looks like nothing is happening at all but it actually is under the surface we are growing internally we are opening more and more to who we really are and then there'll be the time for the action so this is much like the story of the balance of the yin and yang the yin is that deep inner growth that we can't always see and the yang is how we then shoot up and become this tall brave beautiful bamboo this is a very profound lesson of chinese bamboo it's, it's just if we keep working keep moving forward and sometimes we feel that nothing is moving nothing is shaking then we get to realize take a pause take a step back that it is happening just be calm patient exactly what do you do when you feel overwhelmed not in coronavirus in general <laughs> <laughs> when i'm overwhelmed um uh, getting out in nature is my go to support right so i live in a beautiful place so nature's not far out my out my door <laughs> i can go across the arroyo and walk on this beautiful path and look at the gorgeous sky and the mountains and i immediately come back into my body and come back into my breath and i can feel gratitude welling up inside me no matter how distraught i have felt i can feel that okay now it's okay i can be okay that this is a challenging moment and i know i will move through it what are you grateful for today <laughs> today. Well, I'm really grateful to be on here with you Nishant. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> This has been a really fun conversation and it feels like just so easy and I'm I'm really grateful for reflecting about how powerful our inner work is because it really has been a lifesaver for me and it's enabled me to be in a place to be of service to people. and that's the greatest gift of all for me and before i ask you my last question i want to ask you what books have inspired you in your life if you could name some books for our listeners okay well you asked me that before and so i i will think of a few the you know one of my favorite books was one of the first books that pema chodron ever wrote and it's called when things fall apart and it's a powerful little book about how how we navigate change in our lives and her the way that she communicates was so powerful for me because i'd never heard anybody communicate like that and talk about the challenges of being a human being and and 
how how we navigate that. And so Pema Chodron is is an American Buddhist nun who is you know the first Tibetan Buddhist nun who who has run this monastery out in Nova Scotia. So her book is definitely one. And you know for me it's mostly the spiritual books uh, that have really impacted me the most. There's there's definitely some leadership books that have been helpful, but usually the ones that touch me most and give me more, I feel like, ground is is spiritual books that are written from a lineage where there's, there's a real history to it. So even the Kundalini um, yoga books, I would say, are references for me about the history of practices that have been honed and and used by people for 5,000 years, right? So those are the kinds of books that I'm drawn to. Do you follow any spiritual leader? I, I would say I, I follow a few different leaders, but in the end, I, I, I kind of consider myself, you know, sort of devoted to my path, and my path includes different teachers, but I sort of trust that, you know, we all have our own inner guru inside us, guiding us, and that that can be inclusive of different teachings, different religions, different practices. But in the end, we have that inner light guiding us within us. That inner light, that inner guidance, that intuition is powerful. If we can listen to that, that will move us to the next level always. Definitely. And where can people find you online, Kate? Well, the easiest way is to find me at my website, which is katedow.com, K-A-T-E-D-O-W. Thank you so much, Kate. It has been an amazing, wonderful, mindful conversation with you. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Nishan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me. You can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life. You are not alone in this journey. We all struggle in life. There is no shame in talking about it. I go through my highs and lows. I get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life. You can also do this. You've got this. Don't judge yourself. You are doing the best you can. And thank you so much again. Mm -hmm.